Hello, Spark fans, and welcome back to Advancing Spark, where today we're having a look at the identity column. And yes, I know if you're coming from the SQL Server world, it sounds like I'm talking from 10 years ago, but the idea of being held to have an identity on a table is a massive, massive step forwards in the maturity of the Lakehouse model. So for those of you not from a SQL Server-y kind of background, um, if we're talking about identities, we're talking about some kind of sequential ID column. It's auto-generating, auto-incrementing or decrementing, so we can keep track of unique IDs of particular records. So we use it a lot in data warehousing. So we're doing things like saying, hey, I've got a dimension. Here's a new record in my dimension. It'll automatically be assigned an ID that should be completely unique and sequential from uh, the previous IDs in there. And there's a few different patterns we've been able to do that for years. We can do it in Spark, sure. But it's either, always either a trade-off of it's a little bit slow or it's really fast but has a couple of limitations or has a couple of weird quirks that we need to kind of get used to. Uh, so actually having something that's baked into the Delta format itself, super, super useful, brings in a lot of the patterns that we already use. And let's have a look at how it works. So that's the plan. As always, if you're new around here, don't forget to like and subscribe. Let me know down in the comments if there's another pattern that you guys have been using to do surrogate keys or identities that I've not covered. Or if you've jumped on the identity column itself and you put it through its paces, How's it going? How's performance? How have you found it? Always love to hear what you guys think. So, without further ado, let's on to the new runtime. So we mentioned this in the giant mega bumper update that we did a few days ago. Uh, in Databricks Runtime 10.4, we have this little fella down here. Identity column support in Delta tables is now GA. So it was kind of, you could turn it on in previous um, runtimes but it wasn't really announced. It was kind of like a stealth preview where you can turn the configuration option on and it work. Now it is GA, you can go and use it. It is baked in to the runtime support. So you need to be using 10.4 if you're gonna be trying out this functionality. All right, so it doesn't tell us much. It's okay, go and use this create using and then part of the normal create table script. And you can see there's one of the generated columns is identity with a few things that we can do there. And generated columns are fairly new inside Delta itself. So that is where we can set these columns that are uh, automatically populated when we insert data into it based on a, an expression, a calculation, a lookup, some kind of logic that will tell it to automatically populate that value. This is working the same way, except now we've got this identity keyword and we've got some settings we can do around it. And we'll come back to that in a second. Let me first take you on a history lesson of how I've been doing this for years. Just share the pain. Okay, so we're going into my, my old school um, notebook. So we'll step through the code of what I was doing. So I created a new database called Identity. Why not? Uh, and I gave it a location. So it's going into my lake. And again, this is... I think I well, honestly, hands up, only figured out recently that if you give a database a location, you can use things like save as table, which previously was the devil, never did it because we don't want data written to DBFS and it'll write it into my, my own storage, my own lake. I'm creating a database called identity. I'm creating just a random data frame of some people, John, Fred, Harry, Sally. I called them all Smith because I had no imagination this morning. This is the Smith family are being put in uh, to there. There's no will. Um, and we're going to insert that into that new table. So people they have to write save as table identity.people. So that's going to go put it in. And obviously that ID we've hard coded. So that's, that's, there's no logic there. That's not a pattern. That's just a quick hard coded version of it saying, look, if I tell you the ID, we can write the ID down. Oh. Now, most patterns that we already had actually relied on something like that. There's so something in Spark was deciding what the ID is. And there's nothing in the table itself to say, this is an identity column. This is a key. This is a pick. This is the foreign key that you should uh, join using. None of that is actually described in the table. So we've just got a random column that I've populated manually with these IDs from the original data frame. Uh, we've then got this new person, Bob, Bill Bobbington, sure, uh, who we're going to insert in as a new person. And we need to make sure that new person is assigned a new ID. So when we're joining to it, we have a big fact. We can join to the fact that this was Bill Bobbington making a purchase uh, and we can join in using that key. So two different ways we would normally do that. Uh, both of them rely on a little bit of a, a quick check first. A 
Okay, select the current maximum ID. What's the maximum value we have for that person ID in the table currently? We bring that back and we do a first, which takes the first record in the return data set, and there's only one record there, and it pushes it up to the driver. And then I've got that bracket zero to say, just give me the first column. So all I'm saying is it's going to return a data frame of that single column as an actual data frame, going to push it up, and we're going to just pull that out. So max person ID, because we've collected that up to the driver, is now just a it's just a variable at the Python level on the driver, meaning I can use that in my calculations. So step one, work out what the current max is. And then we've got two different ways we can then work with that. First, as it says, is fast but sparsely sequential. So monotonically increasing ID is a great little Spark function. And that's just baked into the PySpark functions just in vanilla Spark. And what it does is it gives each RDD block. So each partition of data held across my data frame gives it kind of a unique partition ID. And then each row in there can be entirely uniquely valued because it's not having to check between different partitions. And that's one of the key things when dealing with parallel systems and trying to say, I need a unique ID. You kind of have to go, well, okay, I've got one, two, three, but what if that other worker is also got one, two, three? What if we both got one, two, three on all of our different workers? And you need that kind of cross collaboration to make sure there's no overlap, to make sure your values are unique. Now, monotonically increasing ID, as well as being hard to say, it gets around that by giving it a unique ID for the partition. Essentially, somewhere in the region of 8 billion um, separation between it. So that's my RDD block number one, 8 million and one, 8 million and two, 8 million and three, 8 million and four. The next RDD block, 16 million and one, 16, million and, uh, 16 billion and two, 16 billion and three. Um, so there's these big, big gaps. And that's why I call it sparsely sequential. Because if you've got someone who's expecting their table and to look at their records and see a nice incrementing one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, they're going to be disappointed because there's going to be these huge swathes of gaps in that sequence so that it can manage parallelism. It's the fastest way to do it. Now that's been a pattern that we've used for a long time. So take our current max ID, max person ID, add onto it the monotonically increasing ID. So it's, yeah, it kind of works, but you end up with these massive numbers. So look, my Bill Bobbington being inserted with a whacking great number because of how that worked in terms of the partitions that we actually had. So that is a pattern that we actually see quite a lot. And it's fine because when you think about a Kimball style star schema, the whole point of the surrogate keys, people shouldn't look at the surrogate keys. They should never query based on surrogate key equals a number. Surrogate keys are meant to be kind of an invisible thing that the data model is stitched together using that people never actually are exposed to. So the fact that the surrogate key has these big gaps in it doesn't actually matter. But time and time again, we do this kind of thing and say, right, this is nice and efficient. This is clean and spark. We like this. And then business users will look at it and go, no, I don't like it because there's big gaps in the surrogate keys. And it's like, ah, oh, it doesn't really matter. But the business isn't happy with the data model. They're not happy with the data model. So monotonically increasing ID, great pattern, really fast, has some limitations if people are expecting a certain thing. Method number two. Well, let's not do that. Let's make it really, really slow, but actually get a real nice, dense, proper sequence in our thing. And we do that using a window function. So same idea. We've still got that max person ID that we got by grabbing the current maximum from the existing table. And then we take a row number over a certain window, but we need to give it an order by. I managed to, you know, we don't have to have a partition by, which is great. So we're saying we'll take the whole thing, but order it by something. And then we can go and do it. So there's going to be some kind of sort involved. It's going to have to co-locate all that data. It's not going to be that efficient. Hence, it's slow. From a, uh, from a Spark execution plan perspective, it's not that great. So we see that quite a lot. Obviously, this means we come out with nice person number eight. This is the next one in the sequence. We've got a nice slowly incrementing, managed, ordered um, process for limitations of speed when we're dealing over large, large, large data sets. And that's the two options we previously had. Okay, so that brings you up to date. If you've never had to do surrogate keys or unique identities, that kind of thing inside Spark, if you're trying to turn it into a sequential number, you either have to use monotonically increasing ID or a row number. 
Or people say, you know what, screw it. I'm just going to have a GUID. I'm just going to hash over certain things. I don't need to turn it into a number. But when we're talking about getting it into things like Power BI, we're trying to get it into a reporting style data model that can actually cut and slice nicely. They prefer it. They're just faster if you have ints and big ints as your keys. And it's slightly nicer for people to work with. So I get it. People are trying to do this. And there is a real business case for doing this. That's why we got to where we're at. That's why we now go, okay, well, those two patterns, one, you have to know those patterns. You have to know the limitations of it, what each one means, what kind of thing you're going to see. And that's not great. So we now have an identity column. So this is the thing that came in 10.4. We've now got the ability to say, well, I'm going to create a new table. I'm creating a Delta table, calling it identity identities just to be really confusing. Uh, and I'm saying I want a person ID with, uh, and it's going to be a big int. Now this only works with big ints currently. So you can't do it with any other data types. You can only generate identities over a big int data type column. I think it's generated. So this should be automatically generated whenever I'm inserting data into this table, it's going to generate this ID for me. And we've got a choice. So always is one. We've got a choice between always and by default. So if I choose always, it means people can't override this. People can't choose their own value to stick into this column. If I choose by default, then it'll allow people to give me their own ID and it will only generate this ID for me if I don't have another value given. In this case, I'm saying always. I don't want people to be able to set their own IDs for this. This should always be set by the Delta table itself. So I'm choosing always as my, my type, my constraints type uh, for this identity column. So always generate this. I want it to use an identity. So always generate as an identity. And then similar to how we'd have it in SQL, I'm saying what number it should start at and then how many it should increment each time it goes up. And you can also do that by a negative number and go down. So we could have a ticker going down to zero or negative numbers if you're trying to match things together, whatever. Um, you have that ability to play with that stuff. Now that is different syntax that you'd see if you're coming in SQL Serverland. If you're in SQL Serverland, we would do this as we'd have big int identity. And then we just have, you know, zero, one would do the same thing. Starting at zero, every new record increment by one. Those two do exactly the same thing, except that is your SQL Server flavor. And that is your Spark SQL flavor. Okay, so we're saying person ID, big int, generated always, as identity, start at zero, increment by one. I didn't actually realize I'd started at zero, but that's how I've done the rest of the demo. Uh, you get used to these things. Cool. So that creates the table. And that creates it down in my lake. So I'll have my delta table created with no data inside there, but that definition of that identity column. I can then do the same thing we did last time. So I'm creating that sample data frame. And I'm just this time exposing it to Hive. So I'm saying create or replace temp view, call it new people. And then we can write a SQL query to insert this data rather than relying on anything PySparky. We can do it by PySpark, I just thought it's a nicer example to see it in SQL. So in this case, we can just do this real simple. So insert into my, that new table we've defined. I'm only inserting into the first name and last name columns, and I want you to put the first name and last name into it. So I'm deliberately not inserting into that person ID. I'm not inserting into our identity column because it is not going to let me give it a value. I'm saying, well, actually, I only want to insert into the data ones, and it's going to automatically always generate that ID for me using that increment. So ran that, inserted those rows, said my seven rows. We go and do a quick select from that table and we'll see that person ID is now populated. I was quite happy that went in. Now I was a little, a little bit confused here because I was like, okay, I've inserted seven rows. That was fine. Okay, I had seven rows up here. Um, but I started at zero. And there's a, there's number four is missing. I was like, what? That, that doesn't seem right. <laughs> so in this case, actually, it's taken one extra row than I thought it would, one extra number in the sequence than I thought it would, and it skipped over one of those increments. Now, whether that's something in the execution plan, something because I was doing it on a hard-coded data frame, wasn't quite sure. But certainly works in terms of it's pretty good, if not perfect. So yeah, I thought I'll, I'll carry on. I'll do the, the next Bill Bobbington. Going to insert him just as a single one, hard-coded, nice and easy. Lo and behold, he comes up as number eight. Yeah. 
So subsequent inserts, singleton inserts, all seems fine, runs quite quickly and came out as I expected. Now, because I had that missing four, I was a little like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how's that actually going to work if I try and insert lots of data? If I try and get a slightly bigger data set and just throw it at it, how is it going to like it? So final little test, we say, well, let's do the same thing, except this time I'm going with some taxi data. So I've got identity.taxis, got my trip ID, which I'm just doing exactly the same. This time I'm starting at number one, I'm incrementing by one, I'm calling it trip ID, it's a big end, the same thing we did last time. And I'm taking two arbitrary uh, columns from the New York taxi data. So the, the date and the distance that it went. Sure, it doesn't really matter for this example. And said, okay, I want to insert into my new table. I'm going to take those two arbitrary columns. I'm going to take the first million. So million records, see how it goes, insert it. And I was expecting, so if this is actually skipping over numbers occasionally or doing it quite regularly, then I'd see my maximum ID here would be something like a million and ten, a million and fifty, a million two fifty. We'd get an idea of the sense of the scale of how often it skips things in the sequence. Uh, in actuality, didn't skip any. So inserting a big chunky amount of data, the, the sequence seemed absolutely fine and didn't skip any values. So I don't know whether it's just occasionally there might be a blip in the execution plan. The worst possible thing it'll do is occasionally miss a number uh, in the sake of protecting yourself from getting duplicates. I would far rather there is the occasional little gap in the sequence than there's any duplicates at all coming from this identity column. Now, that's all the testing around I've done in it so far. Just getting, getting an idea of how it works, how it fits together, uh, what kind of things we can be doing with it. I've not tried to do it with merge statements. I've not tried to do it with a large partition data set. I've not tried running it on streaming data to then try and work out, are there any blips? Are there any duplicates? So there's definitely more work to do to kind of put it to its paces and figure out kind of, you know, essentially, how can we get this to a point when it's fire and forget and we go, yep, don't care. Don't need to think about it again. That's got an identity column. Fine, happy days. Don't need to think about it ever again. And that's where I want to get to. So we're going to be doing a little more testing on this and kind of putting it through its paces with a few clients, trying to work out, is there any way we can actually break it? Uh, but so far, looks really good, performs really nicely. I mean, so doing that insert of a million records, 13 seconds, it's not so bad given I wasn't hitting any partitions, I was just reading from the massive table on itself. I think there's 84 million rows in that table that's kind of stripping down to a million. Not terrible, not great. Um, but it's not a massive, massive, massive ETL slowdown that we're expecting. So definitely we're going to see slightly more performance um, execution plans than we would if we we're forcing a row number sort uh, as, as a window function inside there. Um, so there's definitely nice things that we can say in terms of having this definition on the table. It's going to be great. What it does mean is that when you're creating your delta tables, you need to do it programmatically. And I think that's a bigger, bigger shift. So it's moving away from saying, well, we've got a load of PySpark. And we're just going to do a PySpark create table and get it down. Because actually we need to define it as part of the table definition script. That's not something we're doing in a data frame. Instead, it's what we're doing when we first initialize that table. We're running a script to create it properly. And to be honest, the same is true of other things like comments and metadata and constraints. There's various different things that are kind of SQL only sitting on top of Delta. Uh, that's slowly weighing forward the argument going, you know what, before you put any te any data into a Delta table, you should probably actually get all its settings right and write it as a proper create table script. So a lot of time when we're working, we just have a little function that writes the SQL for us to create a table, and then we insert into it, then we merge into it, then we do all what we need to. And the more things like this that come in, the stronger that argument gets to say, well, you probably should be actually creating and curating your Delta tables properly through a real creation script. So uh, yeah, that's the new identity column. So that is in there from 10.4. That is GA, so that is generally available. So it's not a quick preview feature. It's not something that you expect bugs and things in there. So go and have a look at it. Go and have a try. Put it through its paces. Put it at load. Put it through small incremental updates. Make sure that you are happy with the behavior you're seeing. But certainly it seems slightly more appropriate than your sorting row number slightly easier for the business to get their head around than the monotonically increasing ID and certainly easier to say. And yeah, certainly an interesting new feature that we can have a look at. And that is all I have for today. So as always, don't forget to like and subscribe and I'll catch you guys next time. Yes.